Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar uh, for the project Youth Action for Nature and Wellbeing. My name is Jan. I'm part of Gaia Education team. I'm part of the e-learning team. And because of a project that I, I helped coordinating, uh, I'm here to share a little bit about it. And I'm introducing Richard, which was an important person for this project. Uh, Richard uh, holds a master's in international education and development from the University of Sussex and works with conservation education and education for sustainability, de sustainable development pedagogies across a range of contexts in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Richard coordinated the Youth Action for Nature and Wellbeing project as part of ECO-UNESCO, which was the lead part for the project. So Richard comes with deep insights into the toolkits developments and the other outputs. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Richard, with us today. How are you feeling after having delivered all the outputs so far? <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's a privilege for me to be here with you. We collaborated closely, especially during the tail end of this two year project. So it's just awesome to see our work kind of get to this place. That's not the ending, I hope, but the beginning of something bigger and better. Um, yeah, I couldn't have done it without everybody, all the team involved, of which Gaia was a huge part. So very grateful to be part of this webinar. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it was a really nice partnership and we hope that you get, you get a sense of the whole project throughout this webinar. And we prepared a little presentation where visually you can see better. And uh, while we put the presentation on the screen for you, I'll start asking what was the, the whole picture, the overall picture of the project, uh, Richard, and you will be able to, to share with the presentation probably. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay, so we can see on this first slide that we were a consortium, a strategic partnership with six organizations. Gaia is there in the top left, and then Eco-UNESCO, the organization that I worked for, Resilience Earth from Catalonia, eco Wellness Consulting from Ireland, just like Eco-UNESCO, Youth for Smile from Latvia, and the Rural Parliament of Slovakia uh, from Slovakia. And it was, of course, it was all made possible through the Erasmus program. So this was a key action two project, and it was really striving for innovation. And we tried to do this from utilizing a design thinking planning approach, which meant that we'd involve the beneficiaries throughout that whole developmental process. And in this case, the project was focused on young people. So we knew we wanted to create um, a toolkit, a set of responses to equip young people in a European context to look after their resilience, their well-being, and project-based nature connection and community building skills. So we were really dealing at the intersection between youth work, um, sustainability and environmental issues, and mental health and well-being. So three kind of very key, often underfunded and forgotten about areas. So that's where the innovation was all started from. And we wanted to keep it youth-led. So as well as partnering with those six organizations, those six NGOs and nonprofits I talked about at the beginning, it was also a partnership between the young people. They were really co-designers in the eventual outputs of this project. And the young people came from all of those different places around, around Western Europe. So it was a very international context and it was full of cultural exchange. Um, you'll see later the extent, but we basically took cohorts of young people across from Catalonia to Latvia to Slovakia um, and had long periods of time delving into some of the tools and activities. Um, and just figuring out how best to move forward as a collective. And we knew we wanted it to be very project-based, action orientated. And there were two schools of thought that we kind of brought to the table initially as the six organizations. And we ended up having them featured strongly in the toolkit. The first is nature connection. And the second is systemic thinking. Um, so zooming out, seeing that big picture approach. Um, and it was a collaboration, really, to to enhance our well-being. Um, like even us as facilitators and project leaders, we're also prone to burnout. You know, working very hard on these things, and it's very stressful putting all these uh, international groups together and trying to program seven days at a time for them. 
Um, so we sort of had to practice what we preach and really take this chance, this this non-formal education space to depart from how uh, rigid and formulaic formal education is. Moving from A to B to C, the school bell rings, you have to go and do this now. Uh, this project tried to move completely away from that um, and really focus on the well-being aspect. So those are some of the main themes, if you like, um, from the project uh, that we knew we'd have going into it. And they slowly evolved over time. So it was quite a long time for that to evolve. It was two years. And over the course of that time, we worked with over 100 young people. Um, some of them were directly involved in the six organizations, and others just became part of it through social media calls to action and general networking. Uh, but the young people we worked with were 16 to 25. Um, so there's a big difference sometimes between a 16 year old and a 25 year old. Um, but we found a lot of kind of almost intergenerational uh, peer exchange going on quite organically. Um, and it worked well for us because everybody involved was kind of conscious um, and somewhat literate in the ecological activism space. Um, so with those six organizations, we ended up having six different design meetings. So the way that worked is uh, all the organizations would visit Eco UNESCO in Ireland and plan for an international event. Then we'd go back to our context, uh, recruit some cohorts, recruit some participants, bring them all back to Dublin in Ireland and have this kind of week long event. And we did those week long events four different times. So those six design meetings were kind of the top and tail uh, to help the organizations plan effectively together face to face for our international events. Um, and some of those were tricky because we started this project during COVID. So there were lots of things to consider along the way. Um, and then at those events, all the young people would be exposed to some of the ideas that the consortium had, help us refine it, tweak it. We'd go away and improve it, come back some months later and try it again. So it was like an iterative process of design with young people feeding in uh, to help create an eventual toolkit. But it wasn't just the toolkit we created. There were actually five different outputs for this project. Um, anybody listening who's been involved with Erasmus projects know that you, you put in your application to have a certain amount of outputs. And our outputs were this educational toolkit, this physical book that I have here with me um, for young people, written by young people. And alongside this, we have a case study which documents the transformative experience of young people who took part in this developmental period and process with us. The toolkit is concerned with that strategic and nature-based approaches, and it's really a transformative journey you go on through the toolkit. And so we need an evaluation tool to accompany this. Uh, the theories of teaching and learning are around education for sustainable development and how to transform our actions and our, our ways of being and society's ways of being. And transformative education, as it called, has been around in, in different education circles for a long time. But teachers have been yearning for a way to evaluate this to see what kind of transformation is happening and how. So that's the reason we created the evaluation tool to accompany the toolkit. We also made an e-learning course, which increases accessibility to the content featured in the toolkit, offering users another way to engage with it if you don't have the physical copy. And the last thing we did was to create a pedagogy design guide. A pedagogy just means the theories of teaching and learning. And as partners, the six organizations working on this with the young people, we thought it would be very useful to document how our thinking developed. So this was articulated through this design guide. So it's really a tool for educators, uh, for practitioners, uh, who are interested in about the theories that underpin the toolkit, how they work and how our understanding of them evolved over time. It's sort of in a case, a case study in its own way about our working relationships, how Gaia worked with Eco UNESCO and Resilience Earth and all the other partners. So those five things kind of work together and kind of connected in this web, all supporting and improving um, the use application, the, the ability of the toolkit to respond um, to what it's trying to respond to, which at the end of the day is young people facing eco-anxiety or not sure what to do, what direction to turn. How can we build community? How can we think strategically about the problems at hand, focus on our well-being and take positive environmental action? So that's sort of what the project was about um, in a nutshell. Yes. I think on the next slide, there's some, some pictures of the young people, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so these were kind of a selection that 
that I think really resonate with the, the vibe of the project. You can see it was really, really place-based. Um, so everywhere we went, we would do kind of cultural exchange activities, like in the middle there, we were at a little fishing place in Latvia, having some traditional dance. So we'd mix it up with kind of some more thinking and planning and project planning tools, um, getting out to doing nature walks and, and connecting with the, with the landscape around us and being rooted in, in, in the land. Um, and having relaxing time, like informal time, campfire time, singing, dancing, so that uh, the young people could have a real chance to slow down and connect with others and broaden their perspectives from this uh, more meaningful interaction and connecting to each other's values. Uh, so I was super thrilled and what a privilege to be part of a, a project really made by the young people. I mean, it would not have been the same if it was just us six people like six organizations working on it without all of the youngsters who took part and really fueled the direction and eventual products of, of this project <laughs> wonderful yeah i was part of the the project for one year so i wasn't there for the whole two years but it really felt like the interconnection of all the the outputs and the interactions between the people designing it and, and the young people that were participating was like the core of the whole project and which made it great, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk later about it more in the case study, but maybe one thing that's nice to note is that we had some participants that were with us right from the beginning event all the way to the end. They did all of the different international exchange events. Uh, the majority just came in for one event, but we wanted to have this longitudinal element to kind of have those sort of veteran participants that really understood the big picture of what we were trying to achieve at the end of the day. And that could kind of act as mini mentors or peer educators for some of the newer cohorts that would come in. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I can see several faces in these pictures that uh, hold a special place in my heart now because we worked together so so long on the, on this project. That's beautiful. Yeah. Perfect. And that leads us to the first um, to the first output. And uh, in my opinion, this one really shows the interconnection of everything, like how this output actually built help, helped out building up for the others and 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 so on. You know, one helped each other, one of the all the outputs. So let's go deeper a little bit on, on this one. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we had four different international events and we didn't stack them all on top of each other. We spaced them out over this two year project. So we'd have good revision periods in between. So if you look at that little diagram on the right, back in April 2022, in the height of, kind of COVID, we had our first international event in Ireland. Um, You'll see there's a period of time between Ireland and Slovakia. Slovakia didn't happen until July 22, and that's a three month period, at least in, in between, which you can see replicated all the way down through the project. So the way it happened is the six organizations met together, planned the event, found the cohorts and brought them back. And then we'd have a week long event followed by three months of kind of debriefing, digesting, uh, focus group. We have post event data sets. So we asked questionnaires, um, we did these kind of focus groups and plotted all the data down, and we actually followed up with that same cohort three months later um, to try and see how three months after the event, how had they found things, had they used any of the methods in the toolkit, and so on. So this uh, having an ample time, really, to gather the data and to have these revision periods in, in, in between was very important. Um, so what we found out, uh, we were really interested in measuring three different things. So if you see in the top left, we tried to look at personal development, action competence, and well-being. To what extent any of these three uh, themes or topics um, were developed somehow along the course of engagement with the program. And from the island and Irish cohort, we found that the young people really valued diversity, equity, and empathy and they had improved their systemic thinking skills and they really valued the community structure. We found that when they were in Ireland, um, they became so close so quickly, living in the same accommodation, doing the same activities every day, connecting deeply on values. It was very 
meaningful and very emotional for many involved. But when they all went back to their own context, they found it difficult to keep that motivation. That sense of community was no longer there. And they articulated to us that community was kind of the bedrock of any eco action. You really needed that support system, those people to bounce ideas off and a dedicated space to work in. So we, we tweaked the toolkit, added some things in about community and trialed it again three months later after all that feedback in Slovakia. And here we began to see a theory of change emerging. Um, and we can see that peer education uh, led eventually to a, a transformative experience through this idea of perspective. Uh, so people came from all different backgrounds, all walks of life. Uh, they weren't certainly tied by, by geography or religion or anything like that, but they were connected from a sense of value. Um, they cared deeply about the ecological crisis we're in, and, and they cared about doing something uh, to make a positive difference in the world. Uh, and because they were connected by that value, they learned from the, the difference in each other. They kind of knew why they were there, what motivated them, uh, and they could learn different approaches and broaden their perspective. There are many other steps along the way, but the thing we noticed most about this case study is that the participants were, were conceptualizing how they learned from each other. It was less about what us as facilitators or the organizations were saying and more about what the youngsters themselves were saying to each other and sharing those perspectives. Actually, in the toolkit, there's a whole section on peer education that goes deep into this uh, theory of change. In Latvia now, um, the case study and the, the data coming back really helped us produce a narrative format for the toolkit. So I'm sure, Jan, you'll talk a bit later about how the toolkit is presented, that the characters involved, and, and the narrative arc. But this really was born from feedback from the participants, from the case study, um, because we deal a lot with systemic tools. And people would approach these and want very kind of step one, step two, step three. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? Does this fit here? And we'd always be saying, that's oh, not really how you use the tools. It's more open to interpretation. And because it's systemic, you can apply it to everything. And at the end of the day, if you're, if you're uh, asking the right questions, it, it doesn't really matter if, if um, your answers fit into neat boxes within the tool. It wasn't that way of working. So they came up with this idea of using uh, an example. The little characters might be in the toolkit and say, here we have an iceberg model, for example. It's a tool to help you think um, strategically about action you want to plan. And the little character would show you one example way of navigating that tool and then come up to the top and explain, that's just how I do it, but you have to find your own way to navigate the tool. And the more the reader of the toolkit would see these examples of little creatures showing you how to use the tool, the more they would understand that, oh, okay, there's no right or wrong way. I can really put myself and, and my spirit into this tool, and, and as long as I'm getting something out of it, it's, it's a job well done. So the case study gave us the feedback to enable to create that narrative uh, and nature connection element as well. The last uh, event we had was in Catalonia, again, after a period of refinement in three months. And here, governance was really the central part. So we created the space for community, uh, talked about how peer education could evolve and how to navigate the toolkit. Now it is about how to manage your community of practice um, and translate this, uh, this connectivity you were going to manifest into project planning and kind of an elevator pitch for potential funders and um, more pen to paper stuff now. Um, so I hope that's given you a slice, like a little taste of how each, uh, each international event we had, we were able to go and, and digest and think about the case study, which really informed the planning. So it wasn't like we wrote a big toolkit at the beginning of two years and then tested it. It really was loosely conceptualized in everyone's mind and it was up to the young people to figure out how to shape it. And so the case study was, yeah, a finished project you can read, but it also was an ongoing, like a working document that helped give shape and refine uh, the eventual shape that the, the toolkit would be in. Yeah, and I, I had the opportunity of uh, going to the last one in Catalonia. And that one was the closest we had to the final toolkit. So it was really like applying the, the activities and, and receiving the feedback. But I imagine how crazy and loose it was in the beginning with the young the youngsters. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, 
did you face challenges on that place of uncertainty? Oh yeah, big challenges. Like in the beginning in Ireland, we'd, we'd pooled back in 2022, we'd pulled so many resources together from all the organizations and we're just throwing things at the wall and seeing what resonated and stuck with young people and, and what could be developed on. And we had a we had a working document of hundreds of pages and, and we said, have a browse to this, what sticks out? And it was too much. So we, we knew in Slovakia that we were no longer going to present kind of a, a working draft of the toolkit. We'd select and choose different activities to present as more like a training. Um, and then by the time we got to Catalonia, we were ready with a, a much more condensed version to show people. But I, I caught up with some of the Irish cohort um, just recently when I had uh, the multiplier event where we launched the toolkit um, in, in Ireland, in Dublin. And I was catching up with them and reminiscing about their first experience with the project, not knowing what it would be. And then showing them showing them this finished thing. It's um, yeah, it was a really cool, cool moment to connect with them and yeah, think back on how clueless everybody was at the beginning it's a, it was a complete learning journey for everybody involved you know when you when you design these projects you have some idea at the beginning you put an application you know what what you're trying to do but the beauty is that you have the freedom under uh, these erasmus schemes to really push it in new directions as long as your core objectives are the same which they obviously were throughout our project you have a lot of flexibility to really take energy from the young people and and, and push it in different directions so yeah Wonderful. Yeah, so that brings us to the toolkit, which it's great to listen to how the the four events happened and, and the whole case study happened, because I think it shows a little bit of how the toolkit was also developed and, and emerged out of so, so many experiences, uh, so much feed, feedback from the participants and, and from the partners as well. So what you will see here is uh, like the birth of all these efforts uh, coming together. And one of the things that we wanted, and, and that's from all the, the feedback that we received, all the conversations, we wanted something that was accessible, creative, and, and engaging for, for the youngsters that will use it in the future. So you can already feel it by seeing this little image <laughs> that I will explain it a little bit better. So the, the toolkit, one great thing is that it is for free and you can access it and we will explain later where you can access it. And it's really folks for uh, activists, uh, youngsters, and it's focusing on, as we call it, as it's called for the well-being and, and nature connection. It has uh, almost a hundred page, pages, and it's divided in six phases. And it really tells uh, a story behind. So that's something that we, it was emerging as we were creating. And we, that's pretty much how once we understood we wanted to do the, the phases, we, f we felt we had the, the narrative, a story. And then it came the idea of having like a, a character that I think you had on your mind for a long time already, Richard. But then we were working together and refining the ideas. And that's pretty much when we brought up uh, an illustrator and a designer. And that was a really interesting experience, experience because we were all creating together from scratch, actually from many ideas, but we had, uh, it was a blank paper in the beginning, but we had lots of ideas. And, and so we create, we had the, the main character, which will go throughout, through a journey in the six phases. And I'll show you in, in a bit what are the six phases, but it's, this is one of the things that I really like about the toolkit because you see the progression of the, the character. The name of the character is River and mostly you'll see her interacting with some animal friends that will come and give some
tips or ideas or suggestions or even uh, river experiencing the activities as you will see in the toolkit. Something that is uh, also something that is innovative is also the idea of having the learning icons. So you can see here below the image of uh, the character, seven different learning icons. And the idea is that uh, the toolkit can serve in many ways. So you don't, you can uh, either read it linearly or you can experience it in a different way. For example, let's say if you want to, uh, you are seeking for civic engagement activities. And if you have the, the toolkit on your on you, either uh, physically or on a PDF version, you can just flick through and find the activities that have that icon. That means that it uh, tackles the what is behind the well-being or civic engagement in this case, for example. Um, Anything else before we go into the phases, Richard, that you want to share about the toolkit? No, let's jump into the phases. There we go. <laughs> so I'm going to share the six phases. And starting from phase one, which is called knowing yourself. And that's the idea, like, you will see in the, in the first images, it's like river is in a sort of an urban environment and it's kind of starting, she's kind of starting to question things. That's the feeling you have. And then the first activities will be to support that, to support you to uh, know yourself and activities to offer to groups to know themselves. I brought this example, which is journaling and nature integration. You can see river journaling there. And um, the idea is, is kind of bringing prompt, we bring prompts and we share a little bit of the benefits of journaling and, and how to integrate that with nature. Um, and then the second phase is finding community. And it's really like, once you know yourself, it's really important that you understand what kind of people you want on your side to, you know, make the difference. And, and this is what this phase is about pretty much. And also building community. So for example, the circle of hands, it's a really easy and, and yet powerful tool that you can use for a small group that just came together and you guys can start creating community, building community. So you, for example, in this one, you can draw hands and uh, make a circle of hands and each person on your side will draw the next one. So it's a quite fun suggestion that we do. Although like uh, most of the activities, you can fill it and make small changes as needed on, on your group at that moment. <clears throat> but that's, <clears throat> sorry. But that's how we are suggesting. And then you write, you can write uh, values that you bring to the group. Um, what skills do you have to, to offer? And also like, what are your expectations and, and what do you want from, from being together with that group? And then uh, exploring, finding some patterns. So that, those are two examples for the first two phases. And you feel free to jump in, Richard, whenever you feel like. <laughs> Just to say that the kind of first two and even three phases is all about not actioning yet, about taking that step back, a bit like we did in all the events. And you really have to know yourself and, and where, how you got here and find a community of like-minded souls to be able to plan your action effectively with. Um, so as you say, a lot of these activities you can adapt and be flexible with, but I think from phase two onwards, it's really encouraging this idea of finding a community, finding a collective. Um, and it points to different avenues of civic engagement and NGOs and different spaces of how you can and uh, who you can collaborate with. 
but yeah, I think the the key thing to note here is that there's a lot to unpack and figure out before you jump straight into action. That's what we found led to this this poor resilience and burnout. We weren't being strategic enough. So in a way, this whole thing is is a systemic approach, really laying out the the, the issues and yourself and how you connect with those issues holistically before doing something about them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that for these two first phases and also for the third one, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? Because we are digging into uh, new things, uh, creating new patterns and new possibilities, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's um, it's something can, that can be a, a bit scary uh, for some people doing on their own. Um, as I think one of the strengths of the toolkit is that it really uh, fosters that space for you to be able to articulate your concerns and, and your anxieties if you have them or, or worries um, and your uncertainty, as you mentioned, and be guided through that process. You sort of, in a way, you, you eventually, I at least project myself on, onto River and go through those those that journey with her. Uh, and I know I definitely have transformed over the, the course of writing this thing. And, and I work through many of the activities with, with my friends and families. And yeah, it's it's nice to have some guidance and support through some of that uncertainty. Uh, I just want to point out that um, before I move on, that you guys that are watching, you can write any questions that you might have that we will have some uh, minutes to answer. So feel free to comment and, and bring your opinion and questions. And OK, so then we move to phase three, which is about mapping action. And that is, I think, one of the more most complex uh, phases. It has really deep activities, uh, like the iceberg, right, Richard? <laughs> that we really yeah. tried them and, and, and feedback and, and, and improved and, and changed, and really a collaboration with everyone that was uh, together on this. And in, in this case, I brought up the, the learning to surf activity, which is about understanding what, what are the feelings that you feel when you notice certain things, and also acknowledging what are the systems that makes certain things happen and that makes you uncomfortable and makes you want to change things. And, and also, once you map everything, you can start to understand what are your actions. What can you do to surf the wave? That's a really nice activity that I like from, from the toolkit. You want to say something about that one? I know that you've put a lot of effort. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a good example you've chosen because it, it came from combination of things it, it was a, a young person explaining their eco anxiety as mounting waves of pressure and it was in COVID times our slovakian partners showed me kind of a cartoon of um a, a, a different waves three waves a bit like that first drawing and it, and it was like work pressure and covid looming in the background and financial collapse looming in the background of that and so we had this imagery that we knew we wanted to explore and it, it evolved over many different workshops with the young people but it's also the first moment where we connected um, the idea of having this character and the journey they would go on because as mm -hmm. we've alluded to twice we have this other model called the iceberg which is um, developed by MOT, MIT after 15 years and it's about you know, looking at the surface of the iceberg that's what you see at a surface level issue but there's a big kind of root cause going on underneath and how can you dive deep and examine that and it just dawned on me that oh, an iceberg and a wave fit in the same sea landscape. So how do we have a character maybe going from there to there? And at the beginning, the whole toolkit in my mind was going to be uh, like a big seascape and they'd meet different sea life creatures. And then some other young people said, why does it have to be the sea? Can't each phase be a, a different um, habitat, a different landscape? Um, and she goes through all these different habitats and landscapes. Um, and it just so happens this one is in, in the water. I'll, I'll find the picture and hold it up here because it's quite cool. It's <laughs> one of, um, you see that, Jan? Mapping action. That's what yeah. it sort of looks like there. 
So each time you get to a new phase, the character is sort of encountering a new new landscape. And there are many different things the design team did to really strengthen and improve this connection you have with River. Like at the beginning, she's moving out from a city in, into a more wild inhabitants. And then she gets more integrated the more she goes on with this journey. The color scheme changes. Um, it goes from cooler to warmer and, and all the rest of it. So everybody did a great job. So it's a, it's a really nice example of how um, everything connected and how everybody contributed to making it a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I know for sure this learning, this activity was not done before the toolkit. This is a completely new thing. Um, so it's a combination of choosing some things that worked well from our organizations, borrowing some things from the educational community, the environmental education space, and then completely new things that we've innovated and, and collaborated with. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, mapping in action has a lot in it. Um, and we don't tell anybody what that action should be. It's up to you and your collective to figure out what makes sense for your context. Nice. And that, I guess, brings us to phase four. Yeah. But just before that, I want to point out how magical it was having the, the design team and, and seeing all coming into visuals. So I suggest that you once you get to the PDF, you see the, the image of river surfing which is the next page i'll leave that as a taste for you <laughs> and yeah that, that was a nice that was a big moment um bringing them onto the team because before then it was just my crude stick figure drawings and other people's <laughs> sketches You're like oh, i think it can work but it was good to see it actually come to come to life like that perfect and then we have phase four which is about uh, evaluating action and we actually have one of the outputs, which is developing an evaluation tool and which we will share a little bit more deeper soon. But I wanted to bring the, the leadership activity, which is also somehow, you know, once you have a, a group a little bit established, you go back also to understanding how the leadership is and, and what can be improved and, and things like that. So for example, in this activity, um, people bring uh, drawings and and in those drawings they share what they envision for the figure of the leader. What are and then you can also put in the direction that you want. But you can put what are the skills that you wish the the that the leader will would have in a group. And then you can compare and take many learnings from there. And you can have other ideas. And then phase five is amplifying action, which is pretty much uh, understanding the impacts of the action and, and uh, trying to make the most positive and, and bigger impact on, on positive actions. And, and here we have the ecosystem development activity, which is uh, about creating the conditions to realize meaningful engagements. And you go from willing recognition and until you go to uh, meaningful engagements. Anything that you want to bring from that one, Richard? Just that this whole phase was kind of spurred from the recognition that the partners came from very different backgrounds. So these six organizations we worked with, yes, we're all environmental education nonprofits, but our approaches were completely different. Our pedagogies were completely different. And this whole amplification of action um, was spearheaded by the rural parliament of Slovakia, which are really keen on civic engagement, learner mobility, networking, and all those sorts of terms like that. So in my mind, this this phase kind of evokes the the different skill set and strengths that our partnering organizations brought brought to the table, and that was a you know a big a big benefit of being involved in such a, such a wide reaching project. Yeah, nice. And then we have the final phase, which is the transfer. So if we think back on the phase one until phase six, there is a really nice timeline. And at the same time, we have the spiral pattern, which we explore in this activity. And the spiral pa pattern is uh, that based on pretty much like we see the spiral pattern in nature many times, and we learn a lot from that pattern. And it's basically in a very uh, basic 
conceptualizing of myself, <laughs> it is that we experience things and uh, we repeat experiences in our life. And then uh, if we are attentive, if we are aware, we can then have different approaches to new, uh, to having the same experience, but with new approaches. So that is a suggestion that you use this uh, toolkit also using this spiral pattern. So for example, you can have the circle of hands in the beginning of your project with your group and then revisit again with uh, the, the new, uh, after having so many experiences, how will you experience that activity again? And that uh, represents, is a fractal of life somehow. So that is a little bit of what we explore in this activity. And uh, we have a few other activities as well in this phase that is about transformation and uh, also accepting that life is transformation. So how can we uh, look at transformation to the angles and directions that we want for, for the world, for the planet? And that's a wrap for the toolkit. We have, uh, let's try to be a little bit faster for the next ones. I we have, that. yeah, back to you, Richard. Sure, so one of the other outputs to go alongside the toolkit is the evaluation tool. And it was led by our partners in Catalonia called Resilience Earth. And it's called the seismograph. And for those listening, you probably know a seismograph as a way to measure earthquakes, sense detections in seismic shocks. But you might not know that the very first seismograph was made by a man in ancient China. And it looks a little bit like this, but a much bigger bronze jar with a pendulum in the middle. And there were these eight ornate dragons on the side of the jar, like you see there, and eight toads, mouths up, pointing up at the dragons. And when there was a seismic shock from an earthquake very far away, that energy would travel across the land and hit the pendulum inside of that jar, which would release a ball. And depending on the direction, the ball would fall out of the mouth of that dragon and into the toad. And then everybody around would say, oh, the ball fell out this way. It's pointing that way. So that means an earthquake has happened this way X kilometers away. Even though nobody felt the seismic shock themselves, this device was able to measure that change at that murmur in the land. And so the evaluation tool that we put together for this project uses the same imagery. The reason they use dragons was because of the life force. Dragons are the life force uh, in the culture, but the toads are the indicators because believe it or not, toads can detect changes uh, and earthquakes before we can, before they even happen. Um, so we have this online tool, a series of questions and answers like this one, where are decision made? You pop in your answer and every answer you give is providing one indicator, one little toad. We see the next question here. Who has access to information and resources? You think multiple choice, you pop down however many answers apply to you. And over time, you build up your arsenal of toads and indicators. Um, and we're trying to not measure an earthquake, but measure a change in a cultural movement here. And that's why we've got the, the toads going on. And at the end of the process, one more slide, it'll pop out into a wheel, a bit like this. And all the indicators fall into one of four categories. Uh, the first one is singular internal, which is how am I doing within myself? So I'm answering lots of questions about how I as the individual am doing within myself. The next one, singular external, is about how I am doing with my collective. I answer lots of questions about that. The third one is plural internal. So how is my collective doing within itself? That's the governance decisions, how we manage our own emotions, and deal with conflicts. And the last one is plural external, how my group is doing with other communities, with other groups, what sort of dialogue, what sort of engagements are we having? So those are the four kind of dimensions um, that you give answers to with your little toads. And at the end, it'll produce a wheel and little dragons will pop up, the life force telling you where some blockages might be. And it's color coded. So the more ready orange, the more in a state of individualism you are, perhaps in a bit of trauma, there are some problems uh, with your collective and how it's engaging and how it's working. And the more greeny blue it is, uh, the more collective you're being, the more holistic you're being, the more transformative and innovative you're being. 
And so from this tool, you'll be able to look about what areas are causing you problems for your collective. And it actually gives you suggestions about what you could proactively do. So this is a tool that takes a fair amount of time to, to use and to get into and to maximize, but it's a tool worth taking the amount of time to go because um, the evaluations are an important part of the puzzle. And so it's something you can revisit, something you can do more than once along your journey. And it has a website where you can access this directly. So even if you're not using the toolkit, you can use it for your organization, your, your collective, your community, and figure out where those blockages are. Um, so it's a very valuable teaching tool. Patrick, right. should I talk about this one? <laughs> there you go. All right. So this one is um, the penultimate tool we have to share with you today. And as I said, we are six different organizations bringing wildly different pedagogies. And over time, we developed our approaches. So Eco UNESCO comes from a very peer education um, lens, higher education, holistic and transformative education, four pillars, four dimensions approach to sustainability. We have Youth for Smile, much more grassroots, mobile learning. As I mentioned, the Rural Parliament of Slovakia are much more uh, civic engagement -y and collaborating with uh, youth councils. So we had all these different approaches that over time we refined this theory and we combined methods. And in the end, we didn't just settle on one pedagogy to go with and to base our whole toolkit on. We actually created a landscape. So if, if that exciting word pedagogy or the theories of teaching and learning is what gets you up in the morning and really excites you, then this is the output for you, the pedagogy design guide. But it was really a suite of things from nature-based to inquiry-based, action-based, uh, learner-centered, youth-led, uh, so many different types of deep ecology, uh, so many theories that influenced what we were doing along the way that we articulated them all down in this lovely pedagogy landscape, uh, which gave the partners a chance to develop our own skills as well um, and compare cross-reference um, it was a very nice experience. Yeah, we can talk about the e-learning course. Nice. Shall I continue? I'm on a roll. Yeah. There. <laughs> okay. So the final thing we have to share with you today is, is the e-learning course. And um, this is a way to increase the accessibility of, of the physical toolkit. Um, so it's hosted on Eco UNESCO's Eco Academy. It's for free. Uh, you just have to create an account. Um, all of these links will be able to provide you at the, at the end here on one centralized website. But this website offers you an ability to track your progress so you can dip in and out as you please. Um, and it offers you these different quizzes and kind of reflective prompting questions to kind of document your journey along the way. And then, of course, comment and collaborate with the community. So this is what phase one. Here's a circle of hands, as Jan introduced earlier. So everything that's in the toolkit is also um, on that space for you to enjoy there. Nice. And I see we have the last the last page here. This is actually the slide from uh, phase six, transforming mm -hmm. when River is fully integrated with the with the landscape and completed her journey, uh, and now can look back at other phases and feed in and refine her skills. Um, but the project website is is here: Youth Action for Nature and Wellbeing, the acronym, Y A F N A W dot E U. Um, yeah, and if I could yeah. just share that, in, like Richard just mentioned, like you can find pretty much everything about the, the project in here. You can find all the outputs that we were sharing. Um, one person that uh, comment, I read a comment here, uh, Justice, she said, uh, I joined late, but I'm enjoying the gospel. Is there a way we can get these lights? I would suggest go to the website. You can find any... Uh, any uh, output that we have there. And we have time for a few questions. So we could have a look if we have a few questions. I think Asli brought up two nice questions. Nice, thanks. <laughs> and a nice kitty photo. So the first question is, what is our main takeaway from this project? <laughs> It's hard to find one, right? I think mine is connected with number two, because number two is how can digital spaces support theory of change for ecological activism and learning? I think my main takeaway from the project is the importance of developing an ecosystem. So the mm -hmm. six organizations came from very different worlds, very different approaches, very different 
stages in their own growth as organization. Um, so we were able to help and collaborate with each other and form that those tight bonds and that collaborative piece and have our youngsters also feed back into those process, have solid lines of communications. And the digital space made all of that possible. So I would say the main takeaway for me is to create a digital space for organizations who share values and interests to collaborate and work together, to have those different design meetings, to have people from the comms department linking up and, and sharing knowledge. Um, I think that's the, the main takeaway for me, how to develop that community of practice and ecosystem. I learned a lot about, about how we can do that. And it's just through reaching out, like finding the time to avoid working in silos and connecting with people like Gaia Education, Eco UNESCO, and, and forming those coalitions. Yeah. And I think the answer, answering question too, what comes to me is also like uh, trying to correlate with local actions as well. like. Um, that's what actually happened, right? In the in the in the project, we had all the articulation and and, and the preparation via uh, online. But then we would do something local in the four different countries. And I think that the goal actually for this uh, toolkit and and the whole uh, project is that people actually start uh, manifesting into local communities. And that's that's the point that we will see the the impact, I, I understand. Yeah, I agree. There's a nice comment by Emily. Surrender for the learning and discovering process throughout the development of the project is really inspiring. Yeah, it was a <laughs> really nice process. Yeah, so much energy working with the youth bring. I mean, me and you aren't exactly old ourselves. Um, I'm just 31, but I, I mean, working in the youth space was was really cool and i before this project i was more like a traditional teacher in many of my roles and there's a big boundary uh, between your pupils and, and you but here we, we managed to erode a lot of that uh, and yeah there's a sense of responsibility and, and and you have you know you have important duties to do taking cohorts abroad maybe for the first time in many cases um but yeah, removing those boundaries and like you say, surrendering to the learning process was awesome. And I, I certainly, I changed so much over these two years. Hmm. I was speaking with a colleague of mine when we were launching this toolkit in Ireland and we were doing some meditative stuff with it. And, <laughs> and, she, and I was like, you know, I never used to do this meditation and nature connection before starting this project. You know, I, I was interested in other aspects. That's what drew me to the project. I liked ESD and, and all the pedagogy side and the project coordination, but I learned so much that I practice now, even small things like walking barefoot for a period mm. every day that I picked up from the youngsters who were involved with this project. I learned a lot. And it was amazing how each partner brought up uh, some skills and some values for the group, right? Yeah. Remember in Catalonia, some people would be uh, more focusing on the meditation activity, some on the systems thinking activity. And that shows the, the, how the diverse group can can bring some great stuff together. Can can bring like emerge uh, new things can emerge out of diversity. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. That's being united by a common set of values or motivations. But you need to bring that diversity of thought and experience to shift people's perspectives. That's what transformative education has been all about over these past two years of doing this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. I see that we have quite a nice participation. I appreciate everyone that was watching so far. And uh, as we are closing, any future thoughts on your mind, Richard, or what what would you expect out of the the outputs out of this project? I really hope people will go away and use the toolkit because as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not the end of something. I mean, I, I would love to see the partners continue to collaborate and build it into a version two, but, but in any case, the more people that can get out and, and use it and reach out to some of the partners who are involved, um, the better. So we can refine it, make it even better, figure out what needs improving and keep it as kind of this living, working, collaborative, evolving piece, because that's how it developed into such an awesome shape that it came in today. And that's how it should continue to be. Um, I can see one also comment about the translation because we had um, 
different organizations working on it the idea is to translate it into all those languages so that would be into into english into catalan into latvian into slovakian um, and then who knows in the future i would love to maybe involve even more partners in the in the next round so i see it definitely uh, growing and the, the more people can engage with it the better mm. yeah wonderful i can say that uh being part of the project was also really transformative for me and i learned i learned a lot with everyone involved especially you richard it was a really nice collaboration i appreciate that <laughs> yeah likewise nice okay so thank you everyone and keep in touch you can always uh send messages on guy education uh platform and we can we will be open for future discussions thank you Thank you very much.